Okay. Good evening, bonsoir. I'm Gaëtan Bruel, cultural counselor of the French Embassy, and I'm particularly pleased to welcome you all to Villa Albertine for an exceptional evening. As we just awarded Agegund the distinction of Chevalier de la Légion d'honneur in recognition of her. France wanted to recognize her unique leadership as the goat in philanthropy, as, um, as a champion of arts, education, and social justice. But we are also very honored to have with us tonight two other exceptional women, three exceptional women, notably Laurence Descartes and Katie Fleming as part of the fifth installment of Villa Albertine's museum series, a program of 12 dialogues we imagine together with the CCL, the Center for Curatorial Leadership, co-founded by Aggie Gunn and Buffy Easton. In launching Villa Albertine, France not only wanted to create a new kind of artist residency program on an American scale, with 150 artists that we have already welcomed uh, in more than 50 US cities over the last 18 months, but also, we wanted to create a platform to discuss and contribute to the future of museums from a transatlantic perspective. We have launched several initiatives for museums, and we are celebrating two of them tonight. First, the Villa Albertine Museum Series, with the ambition of providing a new platform to leaders in the museum field, including leaders of a new generation, some of whom are speaking for the first time in New York. On this occasion, we want also to affirm that in order to advance gender equality in the arts and culture, gender equality must also be reflected in the leadership of cultural institutions. And throughout the year, as part of the museum series, we are welcoming 24 women leading museums and cultural institutions on both sides of the Atlantic. Ten of them have already gathered in conversation here, including the president of the French National Library um, for a discussion with the Librarian of Congress, the directors of the fine arts museums of Philadelphia, Seattle, and other leading cities, or the directors of the Musée de Cluny, Musée Guimet, or Musée Rodin in Paris. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the friends of Villa Albertine, in particular to Sana Sabag, to uh, Denise Littlefield Sobel, to Beatrice Stern, who made this project possible, as well as to Cartier, for supporting the spring dialogues of this museum series. I would also like to thank Aggie Gunn and the Crest Foundation for their support of the book we'll publish to continue the conversation arising out of these 12 dialogues. The second initiative we are celebrating tonight is our Museum Next Generation program. While amplifying the voices of current museum leaders with this museum series, we also want to empower or to contribute to empower a new generation of museum leadership with the same transatlantic mindset that is the mark of the current generation. Over the next five years, Villa Albertine will identify 50 young curators and create a community of emerging leaders, notably through learning expeditions on both sides of the Atlantic. And tonight we are joined by the first eight French laureates of the program. They can raise their hands, they are in the corner. <laughs> Welcome to New York. So they spent a week uh, in Los Angeles in March. Uh, they just came back from two days upstate, uh, notably at the Clark, and they are now exploring the New York museum scene. 
The Museum Next Generation program is also, of course, for American young curators. And today, we published the call for applications on the US side. The first American laureates will travel to France this fall to attend an exceptional program of visits, meetings with the best of the French museum ecosystem, of course in Paris, but beyond also. Thanks to one of our dearest patrons, 10 French and American young curators a year, 50 over the next five years will develop a shared vision of the challenges that museum leaders will face in the years and decades ahead. That being said, it is now my pleasure to introduce our speakers, Laurence Descartes and Katie Fleming. Dear Laurence, you are the first woman to lead the Louvre, which opened 230 years ago, but has actually a much longer history if we go back to the foundation of the first Louvre castle at the end of the 12th century. Before the Louvre, we owe you the creation of the Louvre Abu Dhabi, to which you have dedicated seven years of your life. You have met with immense success in previous years as director of the Musée de l'Orangerie and then president of the Musée d'Orsay from 2017 to 2021. At the Louvre, you have initiated a reflection on the universal mission of the museum and the evolving role it can play in creating a dialogue between the arts of the past and the challenges of the future by initiating many changes, both subtle and radical, the most subtle being sometimes the most important, which we look forward to learning more from you tonight. Dear Cathy, Catherine, you are the first woman to lead the Getty Trust, which you joined last August as president and CEO after a career as a scholar of Mediterranean history and culture and an educator adored by your students. And I'm proud to say I was one of them in Paris 13 years ago. You joined NYU as professor in 1998 to eventually become provost of this university from 2016 to 2022. Among your many cultural achievements, I would just like to mention Historima, a massive project dedicated to the collection of oral histories in Greece that you founded with the help of the uh, Niarchos Foundation and that you are still leading today. You are not coming from the museum field, but you have a lot to say about it, and not only because you are in charge of the world's wealthiest art institution dedicated to advancing the arts across its four programs, the Getty Foundation, the Getty Research Institute, the Getty Conservation Institute, and the J.P. Getty Museum. And to lead the discussion, we couldn't dream of a better moderator than Buffy Easton, co-founder and the legendary director of the CCL, our partner in crime for this museum series. Buffy, merci beaucoup. The floor is yours. Merci. I just want to thank Guy Tol. This room is crowded. There's such energy. You have brought such energy to this place and to New York in these dialogues with women museum directors. It's really going to create change for the future. So I just wanted to ask both of you to begin with. You're both noted scholars. So could you describe a little your path to leadership as important scholars of your fields? Laurence, would you like to begin? Just, just um, thank you for, for the invitation to Gaëtan and uh, all the staff of the Villa Albertine. Uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to, to be here and uh, to share a few ideas. Uh, the path from you know, to leadership. Yeah. From being a scholar, I've known you for yeah. Many well, decades. maybe I'm not the best person to answer this because it's something that people, other people, recognizes in you before you know it really. Uh, so it's been, I've been very fortunate in my life to, my professional life, to have um, the trust of somebody in very important French museum, Henri Loiret. Henri was my first boss at the Musée d'Orsay in the 1990s. Um, and uh, I think a whole generation of curators um, owe him a lot uh, because he, he gave us important projects. He, he trusts us as we were really kids, you know, absolutely. Uh, um, probably uh, non-professional, but anyway, he trusted us, and and I think that um, that that's very very important. That's a, the most important thing. It's, it's where you probably, in a subtle way, as Gaetan I say, you go through something because somebody is trusting you with important questions, and one day um, later on, uh, Henri trusted me with 
the Louvre Abu Dhabi project, which was not an easy thing to imagine. And uh, it's, you know, step by step, you, you but progress. But I will say, in all the years I've known you, you were always um, singled out as a leader. So I thought we would explore that over the course of okay. this evening. Um, Catherine, what about you? So no offense to the academics in the room. Um, <laughs> Uh, b before I make the comment that I'm going to make, I also want to thank Gaetan, who did the right thing and got out of here as quickly as he possibly could. Uh, it's been a long time since anyone has wanted to listen to me have a conversation, uh, at least in my domestic sphere. So it's very nice of all of you to be here uh, to listen to w what it is that we have to say, such as it is. So in the academic sphere, I have to say um, executive function is not something that proliferates in my experience. Academics tend to be, uh, and I would count myself among them in, in my past incarnations, like to be deliberative, like to work alone, especially those in the humanities, take a lot of time doing things, feel comfortable with a committee structure. And if out of that context, someone emerges who is perhaps a bit more like a civilian, and uh, likes a good to-do list and works their way through it fairly swiftly and feels good if at the end of the day they have deliverables that have been delivered. They tend, at least in my own personal experience, to rise rather swiftly through the ranks. So all that by way of saying, um, I think that in an academic context, relatively swift upward movement of an administrative sort speaks as much to the context as it does to the individual who has risen. Well, I'd like to go just a little deeper on this because <laughs> I run a leadership program that was founded by Aggie and me to privilege scholars as leaders. And um, so how does being a scholar inform now how you lead? Uh, I think it's very important. I, I, I am um, a very strong advocate of curators leading museums. I think you, you, you need to know what you're talking about. And a museum is about collections, is about art history, is about putting things into context, is about artists, is about, um, you know, that's, that's a core thing. And I think an art historian and a curator by training is, is the best person to, to be in the position to lead it. Of course you have to have a few other qualities, probably, uh, but I think it's very, uh, for me, it's an obvious choice, you know. And you, Katie? So I want to be clear that I am not a museum director. Um, the Getty Trust is very fortunate to have a museum director um, in the form of Tim Potts. Uh, I really am the sort of strategist and administrator of the entire umbrella organization, which is the Getty Trust, but I very much agree that uh, in a context in which you're working with people who are engaged in research, curation, uh, in my case, conservation and philanthropy, it's very, very important that you understand, as it were, from the receiving end, what the work of the institution is. Uh, and as someone who has engaged in all of those things with the exception of, of conservation, um, I, I think it's tremendously important that organizations are led by people who understand the work of the organization from more than simply a leadership perspective. So that was my leading question, and I'm glad you answered it <laughs> the way you did. Um, Laurence, um, last year you had almost 8 million visitors to the Louvre, 7.8 million, I think. Um, and... Uh, how do you get them to look beyond the Mona Lisa? I mean, would they come anyway? And how do you want to shape the visitor experience well, I beyond think that, that? You know, there are, the big challenge for the Louvre is not to be trapped between two extremes, become only a touristic attraction, which was a little bit the situation uh, over the last years, or become something for only um, educated people, a sort of elitist place that can, with complex collection that can be understood, you know, only by a few people. And um, the, the challenge with the Louvre is that you have to talk and welcome everyone. I mean, 
every, absolutely everyone, the kids, you know, at school, um, the Chinese visitor who will come once in his life to the museum. So you, you have to be able to do that. But I think that uh, in this post-COVID you know, situation, in the middle of a very severe crisis, political crisis in Europe with a war yeah. on European territory for the first time you know, since World War II, in a very complex world we, 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 we are living in, we need to give, again, a purpose to the visit of a museum. This purpose it can be pure pleasure, I love, you know, talking about the, you know, fun, the joy you have to look at works of art. But it has to make sense. And I think we, we need to um, make, you know, create the condition uh, for a visit that makes sense, where people find themselves or find again themselves in front of works of art. They can, they, they, they can share, you know, with the family, their friends, the curiosity. Um, uh, it's it's really very very important. It cannot. I mean, museums are not supermarkets. You know, they well, they're something else. So just following from yeah. that, um, I've just read where um, many museums. There's been a survey. Many museums in America dedicate something like seventy percent of their programming to contemporary art, mm -hmm. even if they have historical collections. Mm -hmm. So what pressures do you feel? for the Louvre, given that you get these visitors, it's a kind of paradoxical situation you find yourself in. Yes, it is, it is a paradoxical situation, but I think that the, the strength of the Louvre, the fact that it's such um, a recognized institution all over the world, um, puts you in a position where you need to be very demanding, you know, with what you do. You, you need to be um, creative, with what you do, because a place like the Louvre, paradoxically, can be a place for freedom, because it is mm. very strong on its basis. So you can be creative, full of imagination. You won't succeed at everything. I'm, I'm very much, you know, aware that you know some crazy ideas that I have will will make a flop probably at one point, but it's okay. It's okay because the Louvre allows you to create a space where you can experiment also. Um, and I think that we sh should not lose the fact that museums are places of freedom, you know, of free expression, of criticism, um, and not censorship, and not only consuming art, but looking really at art and understanding it with, with uh, I think, a deep, a deep knowledge and, 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 and sensitivity. So, Catherine, I'd like to turn to you because you do run a conservation center, a foundation, a museum, and a research center. So I was just curious, this is a series about museums. Um, of course, I want you to say the museum is the most important part of that ecosystem. So does the museum. The, yeah, museum. the museum wants, wants me to, wants say, that to say that too. So could you talk a little bit about how the museum fits into that ecosystem. So I, I want to pick up on a couple very important things that Laurence has just said. Um, I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity to visit the Getty Center. I'm speaking now specifically about the center as opposed to the villa, although the same to an extent can be said of the villa. It can certainly be said of the Louvre. It is a location that in and of itself, quite aside from the art within it, is beautiful to visit. It's remarkable to visit. And when I first started working there, I sort of struggled with the fact that on occasion, I try every day to get out of my office and spend at least 45 minutes walking around, visit one of the galleries, sort of remind myself of why I'm there. It isn't for email. Um, and I will frequently see families uh, who've come up to have a picnic on the lawn or who have come up to walk around. And it's clear that they probably aren't even gonna go into the museum. And initially, I struggled with that. And I thought, you know, how do we manage to push more people into the museum, et cetera, et cetera. And I do think, um, while of course it's not a supermarket, um, for many, many people, unlike, I would guess, everybody in this room, uh, the experience of just going somewhere that is beautiful, that is quiet, that exists solely so that you can be in the presence of beauty is a really, really rare thing. Most of us are fortunate enough to have homes 
that replicate a version of that feeling. But many, many, many of the people who go up to the Getty Center don't have homes of that sort and don't have lives of the sort that most of us in this room are living. And I do think that that experience exists, at least I've, I've come to the position that it exists on a continuum with going into the museum itself and encountering objects and works of art. So I, I think there's something very important simply about exposing people to places that exist for no reason other than to give them aesthetic pleasure um, and a sense of peace. And we also struggle to an extent with you know, being a tourist destination, although it's kind of a nice thing to be a tourist destination uh, because then uh, people want to come to you. We're far less accessible um, than you are. But I do think having the whole package feel like an aesthetic experience that speaks to what it is we're hoping to deliver in the museum uh, matters a lot. So I just want to follow up to say how the Getty presents its public face. It's, um, you know, you've just begun Pacific Standard Time, congratulations, that opened last week, which is how many, I don't know, almost 100 organizations throughout 60. LA. 60. 60. That is very transformative for small organizations as well as other big organizations. I mean, really transforms them, gives them money to do things they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. But I was just curious about the public face of the museum. It's a collection of masterpieces and how you balance that with the conversation that people are having around what museums stand for. So um, can you speak a little bit to that? Sure, and I'm gonna look at our curators because it's all about the curation. Museums can be preoccupied with what it is that they own, but people who come to a museum aren't looking at the little doohickey next to the object to see uh, in whose collection it is, except for the person who lent it to us, perhaps. They're, they're looking at it. Um, and uh, although the museum collection at the Getty is more or less explicitly European art to 1900, we do all sorts of things through the Research Institute, through the Conservation Institute, certainly through the Foundation, which is the main backer of Pacific Standard Time, to which you just referred, that bring all kinds of art uh, forward, things that aren't European to 1900, and the museum as well uh, has amazing curated exhibits. We just had a great Cy Twombly exhibit uh, this past fall that people really, really enjoyed, uh, regardless of the fact that uh, those were not things from our own collection that we were able to put into conversation with antiquity, uh, something for which uh, the Getty is known. So I do think the fact that there are these four programs gives us a capacity, and obviously other uh, large institutions have it as well, to do things that are perhaps outside the remit or outside um, what it is people think of the collection as being and that can connect very much to contemporary interests without suddenly saying, oh, okay, we're gonna be a, you know, a museum of contemporary global art. So, Laurence, I was gonna follow up with you to say, um, of course, for most people in this room, you know that the notion of an encyclopedic museum is being questioned today. What, is, what does that really mean? I think people would refer to the Louvre as an encyclopedic museum and question it, and I know that you have begun a new department? Have you, you've done something to stretch mm -hmm. what that means and to question what it is to be an encyclopedic museum today. I mean, that's not your challenge, but I think for the Louvre, it is. Yes, but in a way, it is a model of the encyclopedic museum, but, it, but in reality, the, the, the Louvre is absolutely not a universal or encyclopedic museum. It's full of gaps. It's a very strange... Um, construction where you have half of the collections basically um, <coughs> dealing with uh, archaeology, ancient civilization, and the other half with modern times, starting with the Renaissance. And it's, so it's a very partial vision that comes directly from the construction of the, of, the, of the collection, especially the royal, French royal collections. And those gaps, because the Louvre is full of gaps actually, and those gaps are very interesting to study because um, they generally reflect 
Um, what is missing in the Louvre today, what was sometimes in the Louvre in the 19th century, temporary, um, when you think that uh, Asian art has left the Louvre only in 1945, you know, after mm. the Second War. So, um, it's, I mean, I think it's very important to reflect today where this model is questioned is to reflect also on the own DNA of each institution. Because it's, it's in studying our own history and dialoguing maybe with other in international institutions, you know, that we, we, we can find, you know, ideas and solution for these questions, you know, of the, of the encyclopedic museum. And it's, um, you, you, you were referring to the creation of a new department, a ninth department of the Louvre, dedicated to Byzantine art and, and art of the um, uh, Eastern Christianities, because it reflects a reality of our collection that was not visible that was completely yeah. invisible because scattered in different departments, you know. So it's, um, we are, in a way, expanding the visibility of certain part of the collection, and at the same time, we are working on a new presentation of the Pavillon des Sessions, which is the, um, you know, selection of works of art from the Quai Branly, present in the Louvre as mm. a sort of statement, you know, very important statement of recognition of the importance of those, those known Western expression of art. And for the first time in uh, next year, you will have a dialogue between some pieces of the Louvre and pieces from the Quai Branly to make really the collection and to question, you know, the, this question of universality, mm. you know, of art and of the Louvre. So both of you share uh uh, connection to Abu Dhabi. Obviously, you were provost at NYU when uh, NYU was building NYU Abu Dhabi, and you spent seven years, uh, six, six, a long time, in Abu Dhabi. A lifetime. And it was a seismic change in your life. And um, I don't know, Catherine, if you spent quite as much time there, but I'd like to know, how did that affect you both in, in the way you think about things now? So I'm delighted to take the opportunity publicly to congratulate you. Uh, it's an incredible thing that has been built there. You know better than I that there were a lot of naysayers and there were a yeah. lot of skeptics. Uh, as there were, I have to say, uh, 25 years ago when the Getty Center was first constructed. And it is a real triumph. Um, and for institutions like um, NYU Abu Dhabi, it's tremendously important that there are other significant cultural institutions right next door. Um, and uh, people are skeptical about the idea that you can sort of create or conjure out of thin air um, educational and cultural zones, but I gotta say, Sadiat Island is coming pretty close to looking to me like proof that you can, and that is in large part because of what you did there, and I think it's been very important for NYU. Well, thank you, thank you. Um, no, but it's true that Abu Dhabi has been a, a very, very, an experiment, you know, for the Louvre and French Museum, where I think a whole generation of curators, and a few of them are present tonight, have learned a lot. We have learned to look at the world as it is. It, and the world of museum was, when we started the project was mostly a European world and American world, working together, and I, you know, we enjoyed it thoroughly. <laughs> but the whole world is not only about the European and American dialogue, and we discovered that, you know, um, another part of the world was um, knocking on the door, seeking a recognition, seeking an entry into this circle, you know, the big international museum, and making a statement there. And it was very interesting to sort of translate, you know, what was behind the history of the European and American Museum, this universal, you know, vocation, and translate it and adapting it um, in dialogue with our American partners in order to create something that is only visible in Abu Dhabi. That is not a replica of the Louvre, it is not. Um, but it's something original that was created for Abu Dhabi. And the question we were asking ourselves 15 years ago about around this project, are now at the center of a life of any museum in Paris, London, or New York. 
It's, it's like, you know, like a, a sort of laboratory of what we are going through today. That is the, um, the authority of the public, how do you, how do you um, put into context work of art, you know, um, for an audience that is not familiar, you know, with this kind of uh, cultural references. Um, censorship, how, how, you know, how far can you go, you know? Um, all those questions that were completely new and very frightening for the museum world, hence, you know, the generally very negative reaction to the, the, the project, are now questions that we are tackling every day yeah. in, the, in, in, uh, in uh, those historical museums. So speaking of what you can and cannot do, is there something that you wish you could do that for some reason you cannot do? In, in what realm of life? <laughs> that's, 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 uh, be Catherine, more specific. This is, this is, this is your platform. You yeah, can use it however you want. That's none of your business, Buffy. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, there, there certainly are things that, you know, I, I wish we could do that we can't do, but the, or, or that seem daunting or difficult to do, but I think you can move in the direction of those things, perhaps without even announcing what it is that you want to do. You can take people in those directions. And I w w want, um, in specific, to pick up on Laurence's comments on uh, academic freedom, free speech, freedom of expression in the realm of museums. Um, and uh, it, they're under attack. I, I, certainly at various US institutions, they're under attack. There's the idea that um, curation should please people, that people should feel comfortable with what it is that they see. And uh, if I could do something, and I don't know if I can do it, um, what I would really like to do is work with people like Laurence to very forcefully put forward a public <coughs> statement of the sort that the University of Chicago has had in place for a long time uh, pertaining to academic life around those kinds of issues in the realm of visual art. So I'm not gonna say I can't do it. I'm saying I'd like to do it, and some people are gonna be irritated by it, but I'm gonna try and do it. That's, an, that's an, what, an announcement. What about, yeah, I know, I thought, okay, you now have your we scoop. know. Stay <laughs> tuned, stay tuned. <laughs> Put me in the witness protection program. But what about you, Laurence? No, I think what, what Kathy has just said is extremely important. I think extremely important because um, this, this freedom, this intellectual and physical place, you know, that creates freedom, um, you can love or hate a work of art. That's mm -hmm. okay. That's okay. I mean, there's no problem. You can be hurt also by your work of art. You know, that's part of a journey also. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and those, quest those quite obvious questions are under attack right now. And, then, and I think that uh, places like Get the Getty, like, like, like the Louvre, are places where, you know, you should be free to experience the diversity of artistic expression throughout times. And I think that the, the, one of the greatest trends for the Louvre, for instance, is giving you the long time perspective is also to assess that you can be touched by an object that is 9,000 years old and as it, that it, as it was created today, that it speaks to you, that it's, you know, you feel an emotion in front of it. Or you can be, or can, you can dislike also a universal masterpiece. But it, it's okay. One day maybe you will like it. It's a journey, it's something that uh, deals with your own psyche and emotion and it's okay that you know you you go through different uh, type of emotion in front of art, art. That's exactly what art is about, you know. So you know you brought up something that I mean the two of you run the most powerful institutions of your kind. So do you feel that you need to or that you can set an example? I mean, just as you declared. Um, that you could do things for the field that other places cannot do, and that it's your responsibility to set an example for the field. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. 
Well, uh, you, you know, heard it here. I, I uh, work at an institution that has the tremendous privilege of not having to hustle all the time for money. Um, if our curators want to do an exhibition, they decide to do the exhibition. If within reason we want to purchase a work of art, we'll figure out how to purchase the work of art. And I am acutely aware of the fact that, I'm not even gonna say the vast majority, almost every single one of my counterparts out there in the world is not in that position. They have to spend a huge amount of their bad bandwidth doing things that uh, uh, our museum director doesn't have to do, that I don't have to do, and presumably that frees up a little bit of our bandwidth to do some stuff that uh, those people are not able to do. So yes, absolutely, I feel that that uh, gives me and my colleagues a responsibility that others don't have. We don't have to worry as much about irritating people. Yeah. Well, fantastic. And you know, just because you're in that position doesn't mean that all of your predecessors have taken that position. So if you're declaring that you are the person now who is going to take that position, that's a very important position for the Getty to take. I can only comment on me and yes, my own exactly. thoughts. But we heard it here today. <laughs> no, I think that's really amazing. So, um, so what about you? Well, <laughs> top that. Um, <laughs> I'm among the museum curators, you know, who, who need a little <laughs> extra help, you know. <laughs> Um, not everything is given by the French state, you know, who's doing a lot for the Louvre. Um, but definitely, I think that we, we have a responsibility as, as being one of the largest cultural institutions in the world to be open, to listen to our colleagues all over the world, to, be, um, to react also to, to you know, difficult situations also, and to help as much as we can when we can, you know. And also we have a duty to work together with other institutions. I, I, am, I, I do believe that international relations are very important in museums. Museums and culture go in places where, you know, diplomacy fails. Diplo mm -hmm. You know, it's very important, you know, I, it's one of the Abu Dhabi lessons also is that you have to trust that we, um, we don't have much power, we don't have power at all, but our collection, the symbol of those institutions, open doors, open minds. And that's a very, that, that's where the power is. And our, and our duty is to share this in order to, you know, to try to do good things together. Well, I have one last question for you and I can't not ask it because this is a series about women leading museums and um, is there, are there moments when you're reminded that you are a woman? Right now? Yeah. Well, of course. Thanks to <laughs> but, you. <laughs> but in the work, in, I've seen it play out in the work that is necessary to lead big institutions. I was just curious if you wanted to speak for a minute about moments where people sort of draw the woman card on you and, and what that looks like. So, um, I, I, I would be spinning a tale if I uh, told you that it's been a hard slog for me as a woman. Uh, I am, of course, on all sorts of occasions reminded of the fact that wow, normally people don't look like me in these positions. I actually have a story from my NYU days when at the beginning of my tenure as provost, I was going somewhere and the university had arranged for a member of NYU security to drive me there. And I came downstairs, I mean, it was like a parody. I came downstairs from my office, went outside, there was the little NYU car, I got in the back seat, and the guy glanced in the rearview mirror and he said, I'm sorry, I'm here for the provost. <laughs> and I said, I am the provost. And he said, oh, 
I thought you would be a man. I thought, wow, we're really doubling down. And, uh, and I said, that's because you're a male chauvinist pig. And we started driving, and he looked in the mirror again, and he said, that was a joke, right? He said, you tell me. But that's... The, uh, you know, but the fact that I can tell that anecdote and laugh, to, laugh about it suggests that it has been a, a relative rarity for me. Um, I have been tremendously advantaged uh, by working for and with, in many instances, great men who gave me the opportunity to, uh, to do things. I'm sorry to frame it that way, but they did. They may have uh, later regretted it. Um, <laughs> But in L.A., it is like power women everywhere. Every major, I mean, virtually, with the exception of Michael Govan, I don't want to start naming names, but virtually every major museum uh, or arts institution in L.A. is run by some unbelievably cool, kick-ass woman. And, you know, we, we occasionally get together, and it's like, we, I don't know what the open door we're pushing against is, uh, but the mere fact that one is aware of it and that one frames it in those terms, of course, is suggestive of the fact that it's a relatively recent development. And anyone who thinks that sexism is behind us is out of their mind. The most enduring bias across every human geography, every <coughs> economic class level, and every moment in history has been the bias against women. And that remains the case today. Well. <laughs> but I'm doing all right myself. <laughs> We're not worried. <laughs> now, only a quotation from a French writer. You know, I have a very good memory. I forget everything. <laughs> so, that's it. <laughs> all right, let's open it up to questions from the audience. Guy Tall, are you gonna moderate the question part? We can both look out at the audience. I have a very pedestrian question, but are you, have you been able to open that door yet that you plan to have a new door? In oh, the, yeah, the new entrance. Uh, we're working on it, Diagi, we're working on it. <laughs> It's a, it's a pretty large door, so it takes a bit of time. Um, I would just love to ask a follow-up. It's not about opening that door, but it is about Aggie's legacy and Aggie's focus in terms of art for justice and sort of the legacy or the history of the museum, the raising of the museum and the prison at the same time, and how one was created to say, this is how you should behave, and one was created to say, this is where you go if you don't, and where different kinds of people see themselves there. And I think that what you made, uh, you made beautiful mention of was marking time. And that exhibit is extraordinary for many reasons, and one is because it turns all of that on its head. And both of you made reference, you in terms of people who come to the Getty, not necessarily for the art, mm -hmm. um, but for beauty, space, healing, time, um, to be with their families. And uh, I'm sorry, I forget, I wrote it down. Um, but you also made reference to a way that people are accessing the museum, maybe through a different door. I don't know what the door you and Aggie are talking about is. but um, And I'd love both of you to talk about ways that you are mining the existing exhibits, mining the history, and holding on to it. Because I don't think supplanting or just erasure of history or the past is helpful in moving us forward. But I do think that there's ways that people with, ex uh, with uh, collections that are historical, collections that are European or circumscribed in different kinds of ways that the museum has been, do have a role that can play that's not saying, here, you come in, you're here on the patio enjoying the sun and the space, come in and see our collection, but rather how does your collection adapt to a different kind of audience that has a different goal, where we actually see together, and that it's not just about what's being seen, but it's about how we see 
together. I just think there's so much opportunity. I know you both have thought of it. So, you know, again, I would say this goes far beyond our own collection. It really goes to curation. Um, we currently have a Daoud Bay and Carrie Mae Weems um, photography exhibition at the Getty, um, in part uh, because of the generosity of one of our trustees, Megan Chernin. And uh, tremendous numbers of people have come to see it. And the artists themselves have spoken about the fact that having, in the instance of this um, particular photography exhibition, displaying black faces on the walls of the Getty is a tremendously important thing in terms of saying to people who might not otherwise have thought to go to the Getty, you're welcome here, come, there are things here that speak to you. Um, and it's a way of turning the space over to all kinds of people, and I think that that is uh, tremendously important on all sorts of levels, both in terms of the curation of materials that we may not own, and also how we think about presenting, presenting the things that are in our collections. I don't think that the way for an institution like yours or like mine to become more accessible or to become more diverse is for us to suddenly change our collections. It's to change how we do what we do, not to change fundamentally what it is that we do. Uh, you know, we're used to doing it for specific kinds of people, um, and that really needs to be turned on its head. Um, but it's really about how you're doing it, not what you're doing, I'd say. Yeah, Dim. I couldn't agree more. It's, it's about opening doors and windows um, to other voices also um, around the collection, about what we do. Um, it's, um, it's a state of mind, you know, it starts like this, you know, and, and start also telling all the, um, you know, the, the, the curators of the Louvre, don't be afraid to, to, to enter a discussion. Um, you're, you, you, you always, um, you always find new things, you know, and it's not um, uh, closing the doors are very dangerous right now because for museums, this is one of the things that you need to avoid because we need to open these institutions to, again, different voices, different sensitivities. Doesn't mean that we can change the collection and we do, do not have will, a will to change the collection. They are the, what they are and they reflect the past and they reflect a lot of extraordinary things, terrible things too, but that's it, you know, that's, uh, that's our past. And, um, and I think for a place like the Louvre, it is a journey also, it's a, it is a long journey, and, uh, but it's a fascinating one. And I think that artists, you know, are the best ambassadors for this, because they, whatever the media they, they express themselves with, are extraordinary, um, you know, uh, interpreters of our, our collection. And uh, I'm, I, I must say that the most fascinating conversation I have, and it was already the case in the, in the Musée d'Orsay, are with the artists we invite, you know, around the collection. And but suddenly, you know, everything changes. It doesn't mean that we are not serious art historians and researchers but it means that there's another layer, there's another perspective. And this, suddenly, it breathes on a, di a different, you know, with a different perspective. And suddenly, the Louvre is a very contemporary place. And it should be. It's always been like this, you know, so um, it's the spirit. Can I tack one thing onto this? Or do we want to go with another question first? Let's go with another question. And then and then I can say this pretending that it's answering the other question. No, no, no. So, so yeah, I mean, I, another component of this for me, and I, I don't like to say as a historian, but I'm a historian. And in these conversations, there's this kind of very easily made assumption that if there's a, 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 an Italian Renaissance painting on the wall, that's my tradition, right? Like, it, but history, by definition, it's removed, it's completely removed from us. It's an inaccessible place. It is less accessible to me. 15th century Florence is less accessible to me than pretty much any country on earth in this present moment. And there's this very weird 
um, glossing over of that, whereby European tradition suddenly is this sort of monolithic thing that feeds into something that we all think we can identify, but then the contemporary moment around the world is regarded as being super, super different everywhere. The past is a completely different place to which by definition, the only access we have is research. That is the only way we can remotely begin to apprehend that place. And to just sort of guess or jump to the conclusion or assume that somehow it's ours, uh, first of all, robs all kinds of other people from having a claim to or a connection to that past moment. And second of all, it's just really bad cultural history. Um, so I think museums also have the, the obligation, just as they try to bring some materials closer to certain audiences, to very deliberately distance other audiences from them by underscoring the really important sense of displacement that comes from the remove of history. Yes, uh, I, I have a question uh, that comes back to your comment about the, um, your role in terms of cultural diplomacy. Uh, and I'm just wondering whether uh, under the current circumstances, uh, are you making, what kinds of contacts do you have with your counterparts in Russia and China? Um, in Russia, we cannot have contacts uh, with our Russian colleagues anymore since the invasion of Ukraine. This is um, what the French government has decided. We, uh, you know, we are a state-run institution, so we respect, of course, this. It is a violent cut. It is a very painful cut because um, I belong to a generation of curators who have, but, you know, have seen um, the opening of, um, of Russia and the possibility of working together. But this, unfortunately, is behind us. And our duty right now is to help our Ukrainian colleagues. You know, this is the top priority. For China, China is, is not, um, a, 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 you know, we do not have collections that are connected to, to China. So it's not really um, um, uh, the, the, among the uh, priorities of the Louvre. I mean, it's much more uh, Guimé, you know, the national art for Asian arts, you know, that, that is in charge of the uh, relationship with China. But there are active relationship with China and Chinese museum and French museum right now. It's, uh, it's, not, um, uh, it's not the same situation as Russia. Uh, next year, Paris is hosting the Olympics. Next year, Paris is hosting the Olympics. Yes. Are you planning any special event uh, to celebrate the occasion? Um, well, yes. Well, you know, um, given the, the physical location, you know, of the Louvre at the center of Paris, uh, we will be part of a celebration because, as you might know, it will be the first time that the opening ceremony is not in a stadium, it will be on the River Seine. And of course, the Louvre is one of the key you know, monuments uh, that will be probably part of this opening ceremony. And also, we have a special programming. We have a, an exhibition dedicated to the sources of the um, modern Olympics through the collection of the, of, of the Louvre, because Pierre de Coubertin, you know, who reinvented the Olympic Games at the end of the 19th century um, with his team, looked at the Greek vases, sculptures, to reinvent, sometimes completely invent, um, all the, um, uh, the different um, um, disciplines, Olympic disciplines at the end. So it would be a, a really interesting and uh, somehow funny uh, exhibition. No, we are very much involved in the celebration and with a lot of cultural programming, performing arts also. I mean, it's, it's going to be a great event for France and for Paris. So the Louvre will take part of it. We also want to invite people in the marble room and in the book room to ask questions if they, ha if they have questions. There's so many people here. <laughs> they go back forever. Okay, in the meantime, here, here. and here. 
Uh, this is a question for Laurence Descartes. <clears throat> uh, following something that you just said, you hinted about the importance of the artist. Many of your colleagues today feel that the priority should be on, uh, on uh, social issues as opposed to cultural ones. What do you personally feel should be the priority of, of a museum? Should it be uh, serving its society or serving the, the larger culture? I don't think that they are exclusive to each other. I think that a museum is at the center of a city, at the center of society too. A museum is, a, is an echo chamber of society all the time. And it's what makes it contemporary because when we go to a museum, we go to a museum with our sensitivity and the, and, and the fact that we live in 2023, you know. And uh, we look at works of art with all the questions that are, you know, part of society today. So I think a museum, a, a, the mission of a museum is a double one. Is it definitely a cultural one, but it's also a social one. And, and the Louvre is very much committed to um, many social actions. We were mentioning uh, about Aggie's action, um, the question of prison. Uh, we going, you know, there's a program of the Louvre for the last 15 years. The teams of the Louvre go to the greatest prisons in France in order to share the collection, to talk with, with people there. It's, it's a duty, and um, like going to hospitals to take care you know, of people who have difficulties accessing the museum. And I, we are a public institution. We are state-owned, state-funded. So the, the question of, I mean, the birth, even the birth of the a, of a Louvre, uh, you know, the story of the Louvre, the Louvre has been created and transformed from a palace to a museum by the French Revolution in order to give access to every citizen to culture. That is, sums up, you know, our, our mission. So we are also, we are a cultural institution, but we have social duties, definitely, definitely. Um, you've uh, both addressed, uh, I waited long enough, so you've addressed it, my question slightly in different ways, but um, art museums' collections are collections of things made by humans. There's great humanity associated with it. They're artists, artists and artisans. And um, I'd, I'd just like you to talk about um, the role of art museums in communicating the, the creation of these objects. They're not just art, they're created by artists who are people and artisans who are people and they at different times have been doing that because they're commissioned uh, by wealthy or aristocratic uh, commissioners and they do that. But then ar artists also at all periods uh, have had a point of view uh, that's critical of the society they're in and wanting, wanting to express through their art how to change the society. So I, I just wonder to what extent that you feel that there's a greater role or a, a real role for art museums to communicate what the artists were communicating or wanting to change when they produced the things that are in your collections. Thank you. Um, you know, once, once something has been created, it, certainly the artist had intentions or a thought process or something that they were trying to communicate uh, and it can be helpful, informative, interesting, a form of education as the viewer to be made aware of that, but you're gonna encounter that piece of art the way that you encounter that piece of art in a highly uh, subjective way. Uh, Laurence um, referred to antiquity in this way. I mean, Cy Twombly said, ancient things are new things. Everything exists in the moment. It can't exist any time else. So if I'm encountering an object from classical antiquity, I'm encountering it as me in 2023 with whatever knowledge framework I have, and it might be part of that knowledge framework to know what the object was intended for originally or who commissioned it. Uh, or perhaps, in the case of antiquity, it's a little harder to know what the intentionality of its creator was, but fundamentally, I'm encountering it as me in 
the here and now. This is a little bit of that historical chasm that I referred to. Um, so I don't think it's a museum's job to tell people what to think of specific works of art. I do think people should be given information about it, but they're gonna have their own subjective encounter. And that's fabulous, because that means that every single work of art is actually infinite, because every single person who encounters it is making it a slightly different thing. Thank you so much. Uh, a question that I'm not quite sure, uh, in my own perspective, is the impact of technology, accessibility, and this whole uh, much talked about artificial intelligence, and how would that impact to the museum viewers, goers, you had eight million people visiting. Is there any thoughts on the impacts of uh, technology? Difficult to predict, but um, no, but it's something that we are watching, of course, because, you know, it's very important to be, um, to be aware of what's going on. And it's probably something that's going to change profoundly uh, our, our lives and uh, in many respects. Um, so, no, no, it's, it's, very, it's, it's definitely an important question, but I, have no, I do not have the answer, you know, I can, it's impossible. I, I don't think any museum director in the world can tell you, of course, this is going to be, you know, this, this is going to influence our policy for this and this, uh, you know, it's really impossible. We are at the starting phase of this. We need to grab a little bit to understand what's going on and, and see if there'll, you know, be impact in our visitors' experience or whatever, you know. It's too early probably to tell. It was such a great answer that I'm yeah. going to just leave it there. I'm sorry. It's okay.